Welcome to uh, today's Dean's Research Seminar. Today we have Professor Chris Whitten. Um, Chris is a specialist in equine surgery. He's Professor of Equine Medicine and Surgery and Head of the Equine Center at Melbourne Veterinary School's Werribee Campus. And many of you that are tuned in, I'm sure, will know him well. He's a fellow of the Australian College of Veterinary Scientists. Following completion of his Bachelor of Veterinary Science and then a PhD at the University of Sydney, Chris moved to the Animal Health Trust in Newmarket, England as a specialist surgeon and a scientist. He returned to Australia in 1999 and ran a referral practice in a scintigraphy unit in the Newcastle Equine Centre. In 2004, he joined Melbourne Veterinary School. As a specialist equine surgeon, Chris has published extensively on lameness and musculoskeletal injury prevention. His research on equine limb injuries has a clinical focus and takes a multidisciplinary approach encompassing surgery, biomechanics, microstructural anatomy, and epidemiology. In this seminar, um, Professor Whitten will discuss the research led by his team at the UVET Equine Centre to develop world-first training guidelines for thoroughbreds that reduce the risk of injuries and improve detection of issues that may lead to injury and loss of performance. Chris, over to you. Thanks, John. Okay, so I'm going to talk about um, our research program, and in particular today I'm going to focus on the relationship between performance and injury because it's part of um, our research. This is something that has become more and more evident over time, um, and as I'll point out, I think it's important. It's an important thing to understand. So as John said, our um, equine limb injury prevention program is a multidisciplinary program involving uh, people from multi um, from different disciplines. We have engineers, bone biologists, data scientists, imaging specialists, um, and clinicians involved in the program. And just to give you a brief run through of some of the things we're doing, um, we look at uh, how racetrack surfaces affect loading in the limb and how speed of galloping affects loading in the limbs of racehorses on uh, different track surfaces. We use that data to build models, computational models of the limbs that allow us to calculate the loads in the tendons, the bones and the joints. And then we can make some more detailed models of the joints that show us how those loads are transferred through the cartilage into the bone underlying the cartilage where we see most the most common side of injuries that we see in racehorses. We also take bone samples from horses um, into the lab and apply loads to them like we're doing here um, and the sort of loads that they would be exposed to in a galloping horse. And then we look at how the damage accumulates in the bone. And this is a microscopic image on the right showing damage following the sort of loading protocols that we apply to try and understand how the bone deteriorates and, and becomes injured. We do microstructural analysis looking at um, bone, the micro cracks that uh, occur in bone, as we can see here on the left, how bone adapts to the training that's applied to it. So here we have unadapted bone in a horse that hasn't done much training. And here we have well-adapted bone in a horse that's been in race training to try and understand how we can increase the resistance to damage in um, horses that are training. And then we also try to understand how bone repairs. So here we have on the right, uh, bone from a horse in full race training that has micro damage and then from a horse that's resting from training showing how the repair process kicks in and removes the damaged bone or replaces it with new bone which is the darker bone coming along behind. We also do a lot of data analysis with our data experts and this is an example of some data which I'll talk about a bit later where we have th over 30,000 race starts looking at the speed and stride characteristics in racehorses. And we take data and we do mathematical models to try and understand how the bone responds to training. So here we're looking at an increasing bone mass in response to increasing training loads or a decreasing bone mass in response to decreasing training loads uh, to try and understand how these, ha these things happen over time and to help trainers understand how to prepare their horses for racing. And then finally, we're doing a fair bit of work in the imaging space, looking at how we can detect bone injuries before they become 
Severe, and this is our latest acquisition, Standing CT. Uh, there's only three of these systems in the world, and it enables us to take images of the limbs from above the hock or above the knee down. And here's one here. We got very detailed images in three dimensions of the whole limb, which we can then screen for. Uh, injury and we can see very fine detail like this area of focal bone loss um, in a fetlock joint which are and these areas are associated with the increased risk of fracture. So today I'm going to talk about the relationship between uh, performance and injury and how they're both very much intertwined. First I'm going to start by talking about how injuries occur, um, how injuries are not a yes or a no, they're shades of grey why injuries are hard to recognise because they come, up, come upon us gradually and are difficult to identify early. Um, and then the evidence that limb injuries do affect performance. And then finally, we'll talk a bit about imaging and how we detect these injuries earlier. So fatal injuries are the most common cause of horse, horse deaths on racetrack. An example here of a catastrophic sesamoid fracture in a racehorse. Um, we're fortunate in Australia in that our injury rates are the lowest in the world at around one per 2,300 uh, 2, starts. Um, but as everybody knows, we have had a number of um, fractures in horses in, in high profile races. And the question, question is, is that purely because horses in high profile races are at higher risk, which we know from studies worldwide, or is there something else going on? And that's part of what we're investigating at the moment. We also know that although we have a lower rate of um, horse injuries in Australia, when they do occur, uh, they are a cause of jockey injury. And when a jockey falls because of a horse breakdown, the jockey's injuries are more severe than if they fall for other reasons. So um, limb injuries in horses have both a horse welfare and a jockey safety uh, component. So when a horse is galloping, and here we have one of some of our models of horses galloping at different speeds, they're loading their limb with each stride. And the faster they go, the greater the loads. So every time the limb hits the ground, we're applying quite substantial loads to the skeleton, and the skeleton has to be able to withstand that. And we know from material science that when we repeatedly load any material with relatively high loads, you will get structural damage, accumulation of micro damage, which will grow into cracks that propagate and eventually we get failure. This is a property, uh, a this is a property of physics that we can't avoid. And so we have to manage it in our horses because we're applying repeated high loads. Here's a piece of metal from a um, piece of machinery that has uh, failed uh, due to fatigue loading, due to material fatigue. And you can see this typical crisscrossing cracks that we get, micro damage throughout that we can see under the microscope. You've got a major, more major crack here. And this is typical of material fatigue. When we repeatedly load any material, we'll get fatigue um, damage and eventually fa failure. Here's an image, microscopic image from bone of a, of, from a horse's fetlock joint. Uh, the cartilage surface is down here and you can see it's almost identical. We've got this typical fatigue damage that we see with accumulation of micro damage, this typical crisscrossing appearance. Um, so the same process occurs in horse's bone as it does in any material that we apply large loads to repeatedly. How do we, what is the evidence for this? Well, the injuries we see in racehorses are specific to them. All horses are prone, are accident, they're la are la they're la horses are large animals, they're all accident prone, they all get injuries, but the injuries we see in racehorses are different to the injury, injuries we see in other horses. We know from risk factor studies that the accumulation of high speed exercise is a risk factor for injury, and I'll talk about that a bit more later. And when we look at videos of horses that break down in races, we can see in many instances, the fracture occurs before the horse stumbles or falls rather than the fracture occurring after the horse stumbles or falls. But probably the most convincing evidence is the pre-existing pathology that's observed in the majority of cases that, that we see that uh, break down on the racetrack. So on the right, we have a CT, a three-dimensional CT of a horse that's fractured its humerus, its shoulders up here, its elbows down here, and we have this complete fracture through the humerus. This is 
one of the more common fractures that we get in racehorses. If we look at it in more detail at the CT of that injury, we can see in cross section of the bone here, part of the fracture here, some pieces of bone out here, but we've got this fluffy new bone here on the outside of the cortex of the bone uh, and a little bit here. And this is callus and callus only a callus forms around fractures, but it takes weeks to form. So we know that this fracture has been coming on for at least weeks um, before it's occurred. We also know that when we look at um, sites that are prone to fracture, we commonly see this micro damage, which I showed you before, here in the fetlock of a racehorse at a site where we commonly see injury. Uh, in, and in many horses, we can find these micro cracks accumulating at these sites. Also, when we take samples of bone from horses and apply the sort of loads that we've calculated from our computational models to, to, to the bone, uh, we get failure. And here's a, an example of one of those uh, tests where we plot bone stiffness on the vertical axis versus the number of loads on the horizontal axis. And as we go along, we see the stiffness doesn't change much till it starts to reduce a little bit and then, then eventually it reduces dramatically as we get catastrophic failure at the end. So the numbers of cycles that the bone can withstand before it fails is called the fatigue life. And it's a really important property of any material because it shows its resistance to repeated loading. The other interesting thing about this graph and the thing that even I find hard to wrap my mind around is that when we look at bone that has lost about 80% of its fatigue life, its stiffness is very similar to what it was right at the start. And in fact, if we took that bone and looked at it under the microscope or examined it, tested it in the lab, there'd be no way of knowing that it was here at 80% loss of fatigue life compared to, uh, and it would be no different to bone that had lost none of its fatigue life. After this point at around about 80%, we'll start to see micro damage forming and we can detect that with the microscope, but it's really hard to, to tell up until that point what's going on. So this is a really sinister problem um, as the bone starts to lose its material properties due to repeated loading. It's very difficult to know where it is on this curve and how close it is to failure. So equine athletes are extreme athletes. They weigh half a ton and they can move at 70 kilometers an hour. So you don't need fancy computational models to tell us that they're generating big loads in their limb, but it turns out the loads are actually fairly extreme. We've measured around about four tons of load with every stride in the fetlock of a racehorse going at three quarter pace. That's not even full, full speed. And when we apply that sort of load to bone in the joint, so here's the cartilage of the joint up here, the bone below the cartilage here, you can see we normally think of bone as a relatively stiff substance, but look how much compression we're getting when we load it to the sort of loads that a galloping horse is applying to its fetlock joint. And if you notice the greatest amount of deformation is in the bone just below the cartilage. And it's that bone which fails first, the sort of two millimetres below the surface of the cartilage, which is up here, is where we see the micro damage accumulate most and where the failure occurs first. So we commonly see these areas of micro damage in areas that are highly loaded. Now, as I've said, it's a these injuries develop gradually with accumulation of damage, which is not really how our brain works. So we normally think of when something happens like, like a fracture, we tend to think, look at the circumstances that surround that um, injury to try and determine what the cause is. That's how our brain works. We think about cause and effect. However, fractures aren't like that because as we've, I've just shown, they develop gradually. We get accumulation of damage over time. And then finally, we get failure. And there's multiple things along the way that are contributing to that. And yet, when the fracture happens, we tend to focus on what was happening on the day. And the typical thing we hear is, oh, the track was hard, or the horse took a bad step, or it put its foot in a hole. Well, in the vast majority of cases, that's not the case. It's really just the straw that's broke the camel's back. We've had all these things that have that have 
um, led to the injury along the way. And we need to look at what's happened in the, in the weeks and months prior to that injury to try and understand it. And that's counterintuitive. And so it makes it hard for people to wrap their minds around why these things have happened. And I even still find myself falling into this trap of thinking, oh, well, something must have happened on the day that caused it. And yes, something may have contributed, but it's often what's led up to that that's more important. So as we've said, bone injuries develop over time due to repeated high loads and the accumulation of micro damage. So again, if we have a graph looking at the accumulation of bone damage over time, we think about our injuries more like this, that when we notice the injury that occurred, we assume that, that all the damage occurred at the time. However, in most instances, it's developed gradually over time. And in reality, it's probably more like this, where we've got this um, rapid accumulation of damage due to uh, the horse's workload. We ease off the workload, it recovers a little bit, we get a bit more, we spell the horse for a period and we get repair of the damage, but it may not fully repair. We put the horse back into work, we accumulate some damage. And so it goes on like this. And if we're constantly accumulating damage, we eventually get to the point of injury. Now, at some point along the way, that amount of that accumulation of damage is going to start to cause poor performance and and so it's not this yes or no we've got a we've got an injury we have this accumulation of damage and at some point we get some poor performance before we eventually get injury and so this is the sort of um, thing I'm going to concentrate as we as we talk about this as we go along and just to illustrate the point of how these injuries occur if we look at the fetlock joint in a racehorse so that's this joint the hoofs down here the cannon bones here if we take the soft tissues off this is the area that we get the highest loads between the sesamoid and the um, bottom of the cannon bone if we take that and have a look at it here's a healthy uh, cannon end of the uh, cannon bone in, in the fetlock joint we've got nice healthy cartilage overlying the bone if we take a slice through here of the bone and look at it under the microscope down the bottom is our joint surface where the cartilage is and above that we've got nice healthy bone it's very dense because this horse this is a race horse where the bone is adapted to the training and and become very dense the black areas are the areas of bone marrow through which the vessels supply the blood supply to this area uh, so we always, always need some of those um, but you can see most of them have filled in as this horse is adapted to the the loading of um, race training the first sort of sign of injury we get is this sort of discoloration this bruising and people talk about bone bruising and that's what they're talking about where we see this bruising through what is healthy cartilage the cartilage over the top is intact and healthy and if we took a section of this we'd see these mild um, areas of micro damage, a nice intact surface, but we're starting to develop micro damage throughout the, the bone underlying the cartilage. As it gets a bit more severe, we start to get an irregular surface, and we see that here, this irregular surface, a little bit more in areas of discoloration, more extensive micro damage. And then as it gets worse, the micro damage gets worse in our articular surface, the joint surface gets more irregular, the cartilage starts to get quite unhappy over the top till finally we get collapse of the subchondral bone in this instance. So here you can see the sort of crater that's formed as the bone has collapsed in and we can see that here. Here's the normal surface where the bone surface should be but it's collapsed in. You can see the damaged bone underneath here. Um, and so we have this gradation of injury from no injury through accumulation of micro damage to here collapse or what we could get as propagation of a fracture um, from the joint surface. And the importance of this, of, of, of the poor performance associated with injury is that injury prevention requires our trainers and owners to buy into um, prevention because they're the ones that are training the horses that are providing the stimulus to the bone as well as the potential for damage. And for, if we're gonna get them to wanna change the way they train their horses, we're gonna need them to understand what's going on and improve performance is a strong incentive for them to wanna to do it. Um, so in an ideal world, we'd move the horses from here down to here so that they're, they're accumulating, they're always gonna accumulate some damage, but not enough to cause poor performance. And if we do that, we're gonna avoid, uh, reduce the number of injuries dramatically.
So the question, the question is, why are we unable to recognise that these horses are developing micro damage um, to the point where it's causing poor performance? Uh, lameness develops gradually because this come on slowly, comes on slowly, it develops gradually, so we may not notice it. More importantly, it's often both limbs or all four limbs that are affected because the same amount of uh, repeated loading is, is being applied to all limbs at once. And so we often get these horses that have similar injuries in both front legs or both hind legs or all four legs. And because we rely on asymmetry of gait to recognize lameness in horses, if it's developing in both legs, then it's actually quite hard to see. And I'll show you an example of that in a minute. Often these th problems affect hind limbs where, where lameness is much more poorly recognized because we don't have the head and neck that amplifies the um, asymmetric movement as we do in forelimbs. And so it's a little bit more difficult to see. Um, and then we rely mostly on x-rays to assess the health of bones. That's the go-to method over the years to understand how bone is responding to um, how, how, whether a bone has injury or not. And as I'll show you, um, x-rays are actually very insensitive to bone injury in horses. Um, and so just because we take an x-ray and it looks normal doesn't mean we don't have injury. So here's an example of a horse. This is an extreme example of a horse that has injuries to both front legs. And you can see it is slightly asymmetric, but not very much. And in fact, this horse has quite severe injuries. Um, but I use it to, use it to, to um, illustrate the example of how a horse can move not that badly and yet have quite severe injury because uh, it's sore in both front legs in this instance. You can see it's slightly sore in its right front than its left, um, but it's actually relatively symmetrical in its gait and it's able to trot out reasonably well. What we do see is that it steps a little short um, in both front legs, but this is a typical example of a racehorse that has quite significant injury um, and yet is covering it up reasonably well because it's affecting it uh, relatively symmetrically. And then to use a, again an extreme example to, to illustrate the point with x-rays, these are x-rays um, of a fetlock of a racehorse that has a career ending injury. So in the side on view of this horse's uh, fetlock, we can see nothing. In the front on view of this horse's fetlock, we just see this subtle area of uh, loss of bone density that we can see highlighted, hi highlighted by the arrows. So that's a pretty subtle change, and yet this horse has a career ending injury. If we show you that on CT, which is more sensitive to these changes, we can see that there's a crater in the joint surface. We have a fragment sitting in that crater, and that's quite a significant injury. That means that this horse can no longer race, and yet all we see is this subtle area of lucency on an x-ray. Now, if this horse had much less severe injury, we would see very little on the x-ray because they're very insensitive to picking it, picking this sort of thing up. So you can x-ray your horse and think, gee, it looks fine on the x-ray. There's nothing to worry about here. And yet you're missing quite significant injury. And that's why we've had to move to these more sophisticated forms of imaging. So we're not gonna be able to deal with the injury if we don't understand what's causing it. And what's causing injury is in, a, in very simple terms is more loading than the bone can withstand. Um, but it's not just as simple as doing too much. This graph on the right shows the injury risk associated with the number of races. So from the zero being the start of the horse's career through to if the horse makes it to 40 races, we're looking at the injury risk and you can see it's sort of a biphasic. We have this increased risk when they first start racing down to a low risk at around about 10 races. And then the risk starts to increase again as we go through this horse's career. So the reason we see this high injury rate early, early with very relatively low volumes of training is because the bone is in, in inexperienced racehorses is poorly adapted and can fail relatively quickly with relatively few cycles of load before it fails. So in poorly adapted bone, we don't need a lot of training to cause injury. Whereas as we get out in these more experienced horses where their skeleton is much better adapted, we need much higher volumes. So when the horse is building up a lot of racing and is much more experienced, we need these higher volumes to cause injury. So we have these sort of two problems of, 
low, um, you can do relatively little to end up with an injury when you've when you're not very well adapted and you but you need to do a lot once you're well adapted and so it's not just as an example simple doing loads of loads of uh, high volume fast work is going to cause the problem sometimes it can happen relatively early and you might say oh well that's why this is a problem with young horses but in fact it doesn't matter what age you start the horse um racing at we get the same same shape graph and in fact the later you start the horse the worse off you are because younger horses bone is much more adaptable um, so it's not a matter of just starting horses later to avoid this early peak in fact it makes it worse if you start the horse later so that's racing data when we go to gal um, training data and there's not a lot of this around but there's some nice work out of the uk that's looked at this and if we look at fracture risk on the vertical axis here versus the monthly galloping distance that they do in training we can see that again we have we get a higher fracture risk with with low volumes of um, training that um, plateaus out to the lowest risk and then it increases again as we increase the galloping distance per month. So in very intense training increases the risk and, and, and not enough training increases the risk probably because we're not adapting the skeleton enough here. This is the sweet spot in the middle and then we're overdoing it here on the right. Now if we look at Performance moving over to prize money obtained, we get almost the opposite picture. As monthly galloping distance increases, as we would expect, horse fitness increases and the horses perform better, but there's a point at which that starts to tip over and we get poorer performance as we increase the monthly galloping distance. And that coincides with the increased risk of fracture. So when we're um, pushing the horses too hard with our training, increasing the risk of fracture, we're also result also getting poorer performance so we've looked at the training in, in victorian ra racehorses to try and understand what sort of training volumes they're getting and whether there's room to move in uh, change in changing that and this is work from ashley morris who's just finished her phd looking at this and she did a survey of 66 uh, thoroughbred trainers in uh, victoria both um, city and country trainers and she showed that there was a large variation in the training volumes um, that horses did. So if we look at the high speed work, the fast work that they're, they're doing, we had some horses doing four times the volume of work that, that, that other horses were doing. And you might say, oh, well, that's because some of them are distance horses and some of them are sprinters. And that's true. Uh, and our sprinters tended to be in the three lowest um, groups, but we still had some sprinters doing twice the over twice the volume of fast work as other sprinters. And the same for stayers, they tended to be in the higher distance um, training groups as you would expect. But again, we had some stayers doing twice the amount of fast speed work as other, other stayers. So there's this big variation. And, so, and, the, and then our question was, well, is that actually changing their performance? The trainers who push their horses harder have better success um, and have fitter horses and, and do better than trainers that uh, don't do as much work. And so we've looked at that. And so here's a graph looking at the strike rate, which is the number of wins per starts, uh, which allows us to correct for stable size because clearly trainers with more horses are gonna be more successful. Um, but if we divide wins by starts and we look at the workloads from just ranking them from the lowest up to the highest, you can see that there's very little relationship between how much work they're doing in training and success rates you could argue that it's a fairly there's a weak relationship that's similar to what the uk data showed of the the lowest and the highest had the least success with the more, most successful in, in the middle but it's a relatively weak association so mostly it doesn't really matter how much uh work work you put into these horses for success so my question my question is, why are we doing so much work when there's a risk of injury and poor performance uh, when you do these high volumes of, of training when it doesn't seem to be associated with success? Then looking at our um, racing data, we were able to get access to the Stridemaster data, which um, every horse in, in Tasmania racing wears one of these GPS units during the race and we we're able to get data from thir over 33,000 starts looking at stride and speed characteristics of these horses. And it's a pretty complex data set 
um, and we're still working through through this at the moment, but our preliminary analysis has shown that horses that are injured, so the darker line on this graph, um, we see uh, we see increases in the risk of injury with decreasing speed and stride length. So speed starts to drop off um, with these horses and drops off quite a lot towards the um, where they when they're injured at point zero here. Uh, we have to relate this to all horses dropping off their speed as they get towards the end of a um, preparation. Um, but what we found is that um, there were, were greater decreases in speed in the horses that were injured. And these happened at some time prior to the injury. So we can detect poor performance in horses that develop injuries prior to their injury um, occurring. We've also shown that horses with these fetlock injuries, so these, bruise, these bruising injuries to their cannon bones and their fetlocks, if we diagnose those on scintigraphy or a bone scan as we see here, and so here's the hot spot in the fetlock from a side-on view and then from a back view um, in a hind fetlock. Uh, horses that we diagnose these uh, problems in, even when we gave them time off and allowed the um, injury to heal as best it could, those horses for the rest of their career had fewer races, less prize money and less prize money per start than match controls. So even though we've allowed these to heal, there is a permanent measurable reduction in performance of these horses um, from the time the injury occurs. So really important that we avoid these injuries in the first place. And then my final bit of evidence to look at the importance of bone health for performance is a study we've just completed looking at the microstructure of the sesamoid bones and the fetlocks of racehorses. And so here we have micro CT images of those on the right. This is a longitudinal section through a sesamoid bone at the top. And then if we slice that same bone in transverse section here at the bottom, uh, so this is just the same bone. And this is one of our lowest density bones. Whereas on the right, we have one of our highest density bones. You can see it's really dense. It's lost all the marrow space, the dark areas being the marrow space within the bone. So this is a real, really dense one on the right or a much less dense one on the left. And what we've shown is that horses that have the lowest density sesamoid bones are the better horses based on their um, handicap rating. So uh, the, the more successful horses have less dense bone and surprise, surprise, when we look at what is associated with increased density, we know that's associated with um, being trained harder, um, more cyclical loading, but also micro damage. We saw association between micro damage. So these fine cracks you can see here on the um, micro CT is associated with density. So density is associated with, uh, in, uh, increased density in our sesamoids is associated with greater training load and more micro damage and poorer performance. So in summarizing all that data, We've got a high proportion of horses have unrecognized injury in racehorses, the accumulation of micro damage that's happening and we're not aware of it. It's associated with both too much and too little work. And we know that too much and too little work is also associated with poor performance. We see reduced performance well before injuries are recognized and often permanently and we know that healthier bone is associated with better for performance. So if we want our horses to perform well, we have to be aware of injuries, how they occur, and what we can do to prevent them. And so how can we detect them earlier and how can we be aware that's going on? Well, part of this is just good horsemanship. Uh, good horsemen, good horsewomen, um, monitor their horses closely and they're very attuned to subtle changes in behavior, changes in gait and any sign of poor performance. And what they need to do then is modify the training. So back off the training, allow the skeleton to catch up. And then once it's um, the skeleton is adapted um, much better, then they can start increasing the training load again. And that's really important because each individual horse is different and they can cope with different levels of training load. Um, and certainly the really good horse people I've worked with over the years have been very attuned to this. They may not necessarily know what's wrong with their horse, but they know that something's not right and they modify their training um, accordingly. <laughs>
but we can also go to the more sophisticated imaging. As I said, radiographs are not particularly useful for detecting micro damage uh, accumulation in horses. Uh, so we've, we're in the, we've been using um, advanced imaging for some time and there's a lot of um, effort going into developing better ways of imaging horses. Um, scintigraphy was the stalwart of it um, previously. So also known as bone scanning and that's a typical scintigraphy images here on the right of a horse with a fracture in its uh, fetlock joint, the hot spot that we can see here in the right fetlock joint. Uh, CT is the uh, thing we're doing it more of uh, now that we've got our new standing CT system, it allows us to see these subchondral bone injuries. So these injuries are micro damage below the articular surface in the fetlock joint in this instance. Uh, we can do the same with MRI. So here's the similar sort of image on MRI and this area of bone damage below the joint surface. And this is our fetlock joint through here. And then the newest form of imaging, which is not available in Australia yet, but has just been introduced in the States is this PET imaging which is basically a sophisticated bone scan in three dimensions um, and showing you much more detail. So here's our standing CT system, which has only been installed for about a year. Um, it allows us to image everything from above the carpus and hock down. Uh, it's very high resolution, very quick. We get the images in about 30 seconds. Um, and because of that, there's no disruption to training. Here's an example of it working here, doing the fetlocks in the, on the front leg of a horse. You can see the system go, comes up and then it's imaging on the way down. Um, as the um, system spins around in this donut, it takes the images all on the way down and we get three dimensions. It's basically three dimensional x-rays of the whole limb. And that's how quick it is. And these are the sort of images we get. Um, it allows some soft tissue detail, although it's not as good as MRI, but we can see the big structures like the tendons and the suspensory, um, but it gives very exquisite detail on the bone um, and allows us to see uh, bone damage in the joints much better than we can with X-rays. And this is the sort of thing we might see. And this is an example of a horse that had a fracture in one cannon bone, fetlock joint here. You can see there's a focal area of bone loss here, which is the pre-existing damage that this horse had. This is its other leg, um, which has these focal areas of bone loss in the, in the grooves where these fractures propagate from. Um, and that's the sort of thing we could have detected prior to this fracture happening if we were able to image this horse. And I'll briefly talk about this PET scanning. And we've got some images that have been sent to me by Matthew Spreet from University of California, University of California at Davis. Basically, it's 3D imaging of bone activity. Here's this PET device here with the little donut around the horse's fetlock. And this is the three-dimensional image you get showing you the hot spots in this instance in a sesamoid bone of the fetlock of a racehorse. Um, so it's basically much higher resolution bone scanning. And um, that's been shown to be um, very useful, but it's still early days as to um, how useful it's gonna be. Works very nicely with CT. So here the images are combined with a CT on the fetlock joint of a racehorse showing you one of these um, injuries under the cartilage, uh, a focal area of micro damage in very high detail. So advanced imaging, as I said, is superior to x-rays. It's able to identify pathology early. Um, much earlier than we can with other techniques. And because a high proportion of fractures have pre-existing pathology, if we can image enough horses, um, the hope is that we can identify them earlier before they fracture. And here's another example of a catastrophic fracture through both sesamoid bones in a fetlock. And we have this on a standing C2, we can see the focal hotspot, the focal um, bone, bone loss here that's the site from where this fracture occurred. And we should have been, been able, if this horse had been CT'd prior to the fracture, we would have been able to see that. So in summary, limb injuries are an underrated cause of poor performance. They're associated with both too much and too little galloping exercise. We need to monitor each horse and adjust the workload in response. And we can do that just with good horsemanship or with um, sophisticated imaging and advanced imaging can assist with the early recognition of, of injury. Um, and the 
key take home message is that performance improvements is, is a strong incentive for injury prevention in racehorses. If we get this right, not only are we going to reduce the numbers of injuries, but our horses are going to perform better and for longer. Um, and that's in everybody's interest. I need to acknowledge all the members of my team that have helped. There's been a lot of people that have helped over the years with the research and our international collaborators who have been a fantastic help to me uh, and the team and um, uh, the, the funding sources being the Victorian State Government, Racing Victoria and the University of Melbourne. And just to thank you very much and thank John for the opportunity to speak. Well, thank you, Chris. Um, Perhaps you'd like to stop sharing your screen or can um, take some, we can take some questions. Um, now, please type your questions in the, uh, in the Q&A and, and not in the chat. So um, we'll come to the questions. Maybe, maybe I can start though, Chris. I mean, I, I learned a lot there of something I didn't know very much about. So um, that was really good. Thank you. Um, one of the things that I was thinking though while you were talking was what is the, what is the effect of resting up a horse? So you, you talked quite early on about something called the fatigue life. Um, and and I was looking at the graph, and it was sort of going along so that the the the, um, the bone suddenly got to a point after a certain time at which it might fail, or any substance you were making the point does that. But what what if you rest it? Does it does it then sort of recover and and that um, and and any all the micro fractures that were um, generated they get better, and then you start on that fatigue life curve again, um, or does that not happen? Uh, no, it do, you're right, John, it does to an extent, only because bone has its own inbuilt repair mechani mechanism. So bone remodeling is where bone is removed and replaced by the cells, the bone cells. And that's an ongoing process <coughs> um, in bone, in both our bone and horse's bone all the time. But it's actually inhibited a little bit when horses are in heavy training, but it um, switches back on when horses are rested from training. So rest is really important to allow that bone turnover to occur. And so we recommend regular rests for horses to allow that. But it is a bit of a double-edged sword because when you rest a horse, the bone also de-adapts. And so you've got to then very carefully re-adapt it when the horse comes back into work. Um, so, and there is a slightly increased injury rate when horses return to, to training from a spell. So it's really important to back off the horse's training at various points and it doesn't necessarily mean a complete rest it could just be reducing the intensity of training for a while um, but rest periods from training are really important to allow bone to recover okay thank you i have a few other questions but let's let's um move on um jennifer henry do you want to ask your question Yes, I do. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, can hear you fine. Yeah, thanks for a great talk. My question was essentially answered since I typed it in, but um, it was good to see that there's a lot of ways of monitoring micro damage as it accumulates so that the problems can be detected during the training life of the racehorse. Thanks for um, doing this work because I think it, it presents a really good case for the university being part of the solution by acknowledging and addressing the problem. And around Spring Racing Carnival, the Advancement Office always gets a few inquiries from people wanting to make philanthropic donations towards this area of research when they see the um, advertisements against horse racing. So it's really great that we can position ourselves in being part of the solution. So thanks. No problem. It is actually quite hard to monitor the accumulation of micro damage. So although we have the sophisticated imaging, it, it's not easy to be doing that all the time on horses. So um, it's actually not as easy as you would think. And that's one of the problems we have. And that's why we've tried to develop um, things like the standing CT, which are a little bit quicker and easier to use, but there's still not something that you can be doing like on a weekly basis. But, um, you know, we certainly should be trying to do it more often. Okay, um, thanks, Chris. Thank you, Jennifer, for the question. Simon, did you have a question? Yeah, thanks, Chris, again, for a great talk. Um, I was just wondering if there are any uh, biomarkers that could be measured in the blood that correlate with bone density that could be used to track these um, repair processes with, with spelling so that you can spell a horse for long enough and then monitor its re-adaptation in, in training? <laughs> 
Um, so there's been a fair bit of work done on biomarkers, um, and like a lot of biomarkers, um, they 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 have a place, but um, not as of probably not as good as we would like. We're actually got some work going at the moment, and we're hoping to have a bit more data on that soon. Um, and we are at least seeing some relationship between bone markers and some things that we want to measure. But um, yeah, the problem. And the thing that has always held me back on the bone markers is that anything you take from the blood is telling you what's happening throughout the whole body. And what we see under the microscope is very focal. Um, so I'm concerned <coughs> that a lot of what we, what you want to know um, is being diluted by the rest of the skeleton. Um, so yeah, it's, um, so yeah, it, they're, they're available and they may have some use, but um, it's often a little bit disappointing, I, I find, um, bone markers on what they can and can't tell us. Mm. Thanks. Um, Vern, you're next, Vern Bowles. Yeah, Chris, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, so um, you commented uh, that there's less injuries uh, in general in Australian race horses compared to overseas horses. And I wanted to know, how much do you think of that's down to horses running on non-grass surfaces overseas? And if that's the case, is there any sort of push to change track surfaces overseas, if, if it's a factor? Um, the, like all these things, Vern, it's complicated. Um, so <laughs> in general, grass is a safer surface than um, non-grass surfaces and dirt surfaces which are the predominantly used in the USA are the least safe surfaces mm -hmm. but interestingly in the USA grass is actually less safe than the synthetic surfaces and so um, and it may be because their horses aren't as well adapted to running on it I don't know we don't really understand why that's the case but in the rest of the world it seems that grass is the safest surface to run on um, synthetic surfaces are much safer than dirt surfaces that they use in the States and there was a push to change and they did change a lot of horses to synthetic surfaces. The trainers didn't like the synthetic surfaces and there was a push to change them back um, to dirt, which has happened and their injury rates gone back up again. So okay. um, yeah, that, there certainly has been pushes to change, but the horse racing industry is rather conservative. Um, and so trying to get changes like that through are not that easy. Mm -hmm. No worries. Thanks. Okay. Next, let's go to uh, Peter Den Boon. Um, are you unmuted? I think you are. Yeah. Hi, Chris. Hi. Uh, thanks for your talk. It was excellent. Um, my question is a bit like the, my predecessor here, but can you explain why Australia has such a low incidence of catastrophic injuries compared to other countries, kind of in general? Is there uh, well, the, the, you we do, do better here? Well, one of the big, the big difference between us and the US, which has the highest injury rate, is our um, medication control. Mm -hmm. So Australian horse racing is medication free. You're not allowed to present a horse to the races with any medication on board. Uh, whereas in the US, they have much less strict um, rules. And so, a num so horses turn up with um, some degree of medication uh, and particularly things like non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, which reduce pain, um, allow horses that probably shouldn't be running to run um, and have been associated with increased injury. The other one, big one is the surfaces. And as, as I said before, the dirt surfaces uh, have been shown to be uh, less safe and they do like racing on dirt in the States. But apart from that, um, it's hard to know um, what, why why our injury rates are less than others and um you know something that's we're working on hard to try and understand better okay thank you very much um ken hinchcliffe ken um did you have a question yeah thanks chris um excellent presentation and uh, just phenomenal work world leading work chris you you spoke about the ability to detect um uh, incipient injuries through changes in the horse's gait um, and not everyone's as acute as you at picking up changes in gait. How good is Stride Master or say the Equimeter system from Arianeo uh, 
in actually allowing detection of early changes in gait that might signal there's a problem that the trainer could then act on? Um, well, thanks, Ken. We, we, I think we need a lot more work on that to know, but we've already shown that this reduction in stride length seems to be occurring prior to injury, which is what should happen. So one of the ways that they... Um, teach humans to reduce the load on their skeleton is to reduce their stride length. Um, and so it looks like horses are naturally doing that when they start to feel something. Um, so we may be able to pick that up. Um, and it looks like we've got some data to, to suggest that. But as you well know, seeing a um, statistically significant difference and then having a real world ability to detect something and say, yep, that's the horse that needs to do something is, is very different. And so we need to do a lot more work on that to try to understand it. Okay, thanks, Chris. Thank you, Ken. Um, Natasha Hamilton, did you have a question? Uh, yes. Please Hi, go ahead. Chris. <laughs> Hi, Tash. How are you? Um, I'm well. Thank you for that. I was just wondering what or if you see a role for swimming in training, bearing in mind that the horse has to have work for you know, to train bone density anyway. Um, but yeah, or whether you can say that yet, but do you think swimming might be a way to help get a horse fit without putting extra stress on the bone or give bone a rest? So as you know, we have to get the horse adapted to what it has to do. So if it's going to have to gallop on a grass track, you need to do at least some work of the horse galloping on a grass track to get the um, stimulation for the bone to adapt to that but you don't need a lot of um, that sort of exercise to get adaptation and so if you need to do more to, more to get the horse fit then adding in things like swimming or other forms of exercise makes sense so that you do and, and, and what I say to trainers is you need to do the bare minimum amount of galloping work you think you can get away with to get the horse fit and so if they want to add more to the mix well then they can do that with those low impact exercises and i have no problem with that but at some point the horse has to do the yeah. hard yards on the track to get its skeleton adapted and where i think some people go wrong is that they think they can get the horse fit with other means um and then try to run the horse um on a racetrack and that's not very sensible yes thank you um Charlie El Haj, did you have a question? Yes, thanks, John. Uh, can you hear me, Chris? Um, no, can't hear you. Only me very just. Well. No, okay. That's better. Uh, um, Chris, great talk and information. Uh, I, I wondered, uh, as a way to try and prevent injuries, do you think high performance horses that show a decline in form, uh, that the trainers should either show cause as to why they should? continue to race or be subjected to a complete evaluation uh, to just to try and get some um, prophylactic uh, intervention? Oh, that's a tough question, Charlie. Um, I d yeah, I certainly think... So, so the regulatory veterinarians are trying to monitor horses all the time, and I think that's one reason why they should... That, that, that certainly I think you've identified a, a reason as to why they should be investigating a horse. If a horse is performing poorly, um, and I think they already do this, um, you know, stewards nearly always ask for the horse to be examined, but perhaps they might be um, asking for a more intensive examination if that's the case. Um, but yes, certainly that I, I'm, is a good reason as to why the regulatory vets should, would be paying more attention to a particular horse if it's performing poor, uh, below expectations. And I, th I think that's certainly what they already do to a degree. Thanks, Chris. Chris, following on a little bit from Charlie's question there, um, I had another question and that was, you, you talked a lot about the, um, the technology and the improvements in technology and you showed us the scintigraphy and then you showed us the MRI and the and then the standing CT that you've got and and then the PET CT. Um, given that all these technologies are now look to me anyway pretty good at detecting the small levels of injury, is there a regulatory case to be had that um, all horses should be 
um, scanned in some way before races. Because unless, like many things, unless there's some regulation, um, there's, a, there's a financial incentive for the racehorse owners to just race that horse. Uh, it's like many sectors of society, regulation actually stops the, um, stops the things that shouldn't be happening. So what's, what's your, it's kind of following on from what Charlie said, but what's, sure. what's your thoughts on that? Is yeah, it possible um, to even do it? Well, the, the logistics of that would be very difficult um, at the moment, but, you know, it's not like, it doesn't mean it's not something we should uh, strive for. Um, and currently, as you know, um, for the high profile races, veterinary inspection is now um, routine for all horses entered into high profile races. They get Go, go on over with a fine tooth comb and then if the vets are concerned that's when they um, request for the um, more detailed imaging. Um, it's relatively early days with um, the sophisticated imaging and I think we probably need a lot more data before we start saying things like what you suggest um, but there's definitely a case for doing a lot more to try and um, pick up a lot more and do it more often and certainly um, you know, if I owned an expensive racehorse, I personally would be getting it um, imaged, you know, perhaps once a year or once every six months to see where I was at and how the, how the horse was coping with the training. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't have any more questions on the, on the panel and we're in perfect timing of uh, uh, the hour slot that we had. So I guess it just remains for me to thank Chris. Um, I thought that was a fascinating talk. As I said earlier, I, I learned a lot. And Chris, you put it over so well. Um, and I see the importance of it. Uh, great research. Um, congratulations to you and your team. And um, thank you very much. Thank you, John. And thank you, everybody. <laughs>